FBI, and it is my pleasure and privilege to um, welcome you all this evening to uh, the, I guess, the concluding session of um, our discussion series, Confronting Racism as Jews, um, and uh, particularly to welcome Chad Lassiter to a virtual BZBI. Um, and we'll uh, do that in just a moment. Um, I wanna take this opportunity as tonight is the conclusion of this series to uh, thank Rabbi Batya Glazer and Jason Holtzman and the entire Jewish Community Relations Council of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia for um, putting on this discussion series for us. Um, it's, it was, uh, you know, it certainly seemed to us to be a vital conversation to be having even a month ago. And um, certainly this week, I think there could be no more essential conversation to have. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Rabbi Batya and Jason and um, all of the, the board and staff of the JCRC for working with us on this. Um, and I want to just, uh, again, kind of call everyone's attention to a few things. Um, as this series is wrapping up, we're uh, preparing for a series of smaller scale, more intimate discu uh, discussions, facilitated discussions of books and articles uh, hosted by Arlene Fickler and Dan Siegel that will help us further explore the impact of systemic racism and our place as Jews in the broader conversation about race in America. Um, and there will be more information coming up about that as well. Um, we will also have details coming about a lecture with Dana Bazelon from the district attorney's office talking about uh, criminal justice reform and really focusing on issues that are impacting here in Philadelphia and uh, what the DA's office is doing to um, you know, further the causes of justice in their work. Um, and uh, most immediately, and I would say most importantly for right now, um, there's information out now and we'll be sending it out in our email tomorrow about an interfaith prayer vigil that will be held uh, online hosted by the Interfaith Center of Philadelphia. Um, and that will be tomorrow at 5.30. Uh, BZBI's regular afternoon service is gonna be moved later to accommodate people's attendance at that. Um, and there's, uh, I'm putting in the chat box right now, the registration link for that Zoom meeting. Uh, so the registration link that just went in is for the Interfaith Prayer Vigil tomorrow. Um, you can use that link to register. And uh, in a moment, as I uh, give the bio and introduction to Chad Dion Lassiter, um, that could be a good opportunity for you to listen to me while clicking over to go ahead and register to be present at uh, tomorrow's prayer vigil. Um, I'm also um, want to let everyone know that uh, Rabbi Annie Lewis and I will be uh, hosting a short worship fellowship service immediately after tonight's program. So uh, if you're interested in sticking around for a little bit of spiritual connection with others who are sticking around um, when we're at the conclusion of tonight's program, uh, we just invite you to stay on the Zoom and uh, we'll get that started uh, shortly after tonight's program concludes. I'm, I'm really pleased to be welcoming Chad Dion Lassiter to virtual BZBI this evening. Um, the conversations that we've had over the past few weeks have been frank and honest and invigorating, um, but one of the most important things for us as allies in the struggle for human rights in America is to hear and bear witness to the testimony of members of the Black community who speak to their personal experience of race in America. Um, and it is a particular privilege to welcome Mr. Lassiter this evening. Uh, he is the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Human Rights Co uh, Commission and a nationally recognized expert in the fields of American race relations and violence prevention among African-American males. He's worked on race, peace, and poverty-related issues in Africa, Canada, Haiti, Norway, and um, I think very special to many of us on this call tonight in Israel as well. As the co-director of Family, Fostering, Adopting, and Mentoring to Improve the Lives of Youth, 
He works with youth to improve their life outcomes by providing mentors to young people who have a parent incarcerated in a state or federal prison. And prior to accepting his current position, he was a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was the 2008 recipient of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Community Involvement Award, as well as a visiting lecturer at Westchester University in their undergraduate school of social work. Um, and so it is uh, with immense gratitude to you, uh, Chad, for being here with us tonight in what I'm sure has been an insanely hectic week for you. Um, I'm just from the bottom of my heart so happy to have you here and so grateful for your taking the time to share with us this evening. Chad, you're still muted. What about now? There you go. Thank you so much for having me. So let me, let me echo um, Abe's, Abe's welcome. Um, I'm always grateful when you take the time to engage and, and work, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with you and at this particular time. Um, I, when I know the community is, is searching for opportunities to be engaged in meaningful ways, um, to have had this meeting with you on the schedule already was a great blessing. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And, and let me just say publicly that uh, I love you with an agape love. We met about a year ago in Harrisburg uh, in the conference room at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. And we said we were going to change the world and strengthen the ties between African Americans and, and Jews. And we were looking forward to that. And this pandemic hit and through a lot of the action items that we put down, uh, put them on the back burner, but we'll get to them. So I'm humbled to be here uh, and looking forward to our, our frank and candid, earnest uh, conversation this evening. Thank you. Um, Chad, can you share with us your personal journey and how your personal attitudes toward race and racism have evolved, um, as well as how you understand your work and what is the role of the Human Relations Commission and how you understand your personal mission. Yeah, certainly. I, I wanted to open up uh, with Isaiah chapter six, verse eight. Uh, I love uh, Isaiah, I love uh, King David, and I love Daniel, and uh, I come out of that tradition. In Isaiah chapter six, verse eight, it says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Um, when we look at uh, a personal journey, um, and, and for those who are viewing this, uh, you're going to see a lot of vulnerability this evening. Uh, you may, in fact, see me cry because uh, I'm in pain for humanity and not because of uh, the most recent incident for uh, George Floyd, but just in general, simply because oftentimes in our democracy, uh, we don't acknowledge the challenges uh, that we see. Uh, we don't speak out on them. We don't use our life as a vehicle to alleviate the suffering of them. Uh, and so I tend to trend on all sides of the color line and gender line. Uh, if white males were being killed with impunity by black officers, I would be pledging my humanity to them. Uh, but I'm really challenged at this particular point in time in our democracy uh, because of the increased forms of anti-Semitism, uh, the xenophobia we see, the homophobia we see, the transphobia we see. Uh, we know that uh, there is structural and systemic oppression. We know that there's institutional racism, which is prejudice plus power. Uh, there's also a lot of racial paranoia that exists in, 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 in my community uh, and a lot of victimization. And that, that's uh, something that a lot of African Americans don't, don't speak about. Uh, and so for me, uh, I just wanted to frame that out, that as I get into my personal journey, as I tell you, in fact, what the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission is uh, and things of that nature. Uh, for me, I grew up uh, in a very uh, close-knit community. Uh, the community I grew up in was North Philly, uh, but not the stereotypical aspect of North Philly, but a, a North Philly that was working class, that was extremely diverse. Uh, I, was, uh, I lived at 4433 North 9th Street, and at 4435, which was a duplex right next to my four bedroom home with my mom and dad, uh, my brother and my grandmother was a Jewish woman 
who would always just encourage my brother and I. My brother was six foot nine. I'm six six. Uh, he couldn't play a lick of basketball. I couldn't play a lick of basketball. Um, our parents didn't want us to play basketball. They put uh, important books in our hands. Uh, but Ms. Rosenberg would always have a kind word to say, and it was and growing up in that community uh, where we would do things for our neighbors, and, and especially Ms. Rosenberg, we would cut cut our grass, we would cut our hedges, we would go to the store for them. We could never receive money. Uh, our parents said you're supposed to do it because she's she's an elder, and they would trend on all sides of the color line. Uh, but in our home, it was similar to our community. It was a lot of ethnocentrism. It was. Uh, where we were the product of a black community for the most part. Uh, we went to a black church. Uh, my church uh, that I still go to that I've been at for 47 years is uh, Triumph Baptist Church. Uh, the pastor is Reverend James S. Hall Jr. Uh, and then, you know, all of the people that we hung with were African Americans, um, even though we came from a diverse community. My parents were a little bit different. Um, my mom uh, was a branch chief at the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, she came of age during the uh, Cecil B. Moore uh, riots around Girard College. Uh, my dad, he was in the service, uh, served three tours in Vietnam, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, my grandmother actually was the, she cleaned for Jewish people, uh, and then she also started uh, being a housekeeper and caretaker for Sadie T. Alexander, the first African-American woman in our mm -hmm. democracy to get a PhD uh, in economics as well as a JD from the Penn Law School. Uh, as Ms. A, as we would call her as little kids, Ms. Alexander started to get uh, this whole aspect of early onset of dementia, uh, she started to fade away, um, but my grandmother still took care of her. Uh, I would like to think that that's why my mom trended in her life because of that relationship to University of Penn, and I trended to go to University of Penn too. I used to pick up her law books, her husband law books, couldn't read at that tender age the Socratic stuff that was in those law books, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I, I had a fight for justice. I guess it was planted then. Uh, I left North Philadelphia. I went to a historical black college and university. That's more of a journey of ethnocentrism. Uh, when you get down there, just like the African-American community in Charlotte, North Carolina, you learn about great blacks uh, like W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, and, and multiple others. But it was at that time where uh, I learned about Rabbi Abraham Yahshua Heschel. And I learned about this concept of the beloved community. And I learned about how uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard University and penned three seminal works, multiple works, but three that come to mind, uh, Philadelphia Negro, Souls of Black Folk and Black Reconstruction. And he spoke about John Brown, this abolitionist. And I started saying, what's his fascination with John Brown? Uh, because in parts of my community, we were socialized just to trend on the black side, that white folk hadn't helped us with anything, even though we may have read in a textbook, but it was a footnote, the Underground Railroad, white abolitionists. But it was at that time where I did some research prior to going to Johnson C. Smith, uh, that it was the Biddle family who were white abolitionists in Germantown, PA, that created this university for uh, newly freed slaves. Uh, and then further research lend uh, to the intellectual property and discovery that a lot of our historical black colleges and universities uh, actually were started by white individuals. And then a lot of our Jewish professors, uh, because of anti-Semitism, because of racism, because of the negating of their Jewish humanity, because of all the things that the world had tried to do to them, i.e. trying to deny that the Holocaust occurred and things of that nature, they couldn't get into Princeton University Columbia University, Yale University, uh, University of Penn, and multiple other prestigious universities like MIT. So they began their tenure at historical black colleges and universities. Uh, that became fascinating for me. And so it was at that time where I ended up coming upon a Jewish professor at a historical black college university uh, and, and working uh, with him, allowing him to mentor me. Uh, and I'm very careful with ling linguistics, allowing him to, to mentor me, because I think the most effective forms of mentor-mentee relationships is when you allow someone to pour your, themselves into you. Uh, from there, I'm studying about uh, Black history, but I'm also studying Jewish history, not in the curriculum, but from him. And I'm reading more and more about the coalition building and the civil rights from a theoretic theoretical framework and practical application of how someone like Senator Joe Lieberman uh, could have went straight from uh, undergrad to graduate school. And he said, I'm not going to go. I'm going to go south with the Freedom Riders. And we're learning about Jews and whites and others who decided to 
take their humanity, pledge it to black humanity so the, the democracy could see full humanity. And so I'm learning about uh, the racist undertones of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, but also Oscar Michaud, a black uh, filmmaker who did Birth of a Race. Uh, and I'm learning so much more and I'm pushing myself and I'm just immersing myself into multiple cultures. But I never discovered a synagogue uh, that was down in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, but th at this time, I also wasn't going to church because I was away from the structure of my mother, my father, say your grace before you eat and all those things. I had a couple of years when I was kind of like wayward and I'm at a black college and I'm leaving this Christian home and I'm seeing all types of shades of black young ladies. And I'm just like a kid in a candy store, but in an appropriate way. Uh, and so then I come back to Philadelphia and I start working at the uh, Philadelphia Child Guidance Center, and I met a Jewish gentleman by the name of Dr. Arthur Schwartz, who was a therapist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Child Guidance Center. And he said, listen, you really seem good with children. I had got my bachelor's of social work from Johnson C. Smith. He said, you should further your education to come to University of Penn. Ah, I'm not, I can't get into University of Penn. I'm from North Philadelphia, even though, you know, at this time, I wasn't aware of legacy admissions <laughs> that, you know, if your parent went to the University of Penn or, or things of that nature, you can get a couple of points on applications. That's an amazing form of uh, white privilege as well as, you know, affirmative action. Uh, reminds me of Ira Katz Nelson's work when affirmative action was white. Uh, but I end up going to University of Penn and now I'm in a classroom with Jewish students. And I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm with Jewish students, but I'm still caught up in my ethnocentrism. And then I started learning a lot about the Holocaust and I started learning about suffering on the other side of the color line. Um, in a home, I never looked at other females other than African-American, because if you come from the black community, not generalizing the stereotype, and you, know, you hear your grandmother, your mother say, if she can't take the comb, don't bring her home. Meaning the metaphor, real life situation of the curling iron, kind of nappy hair and things of that nature. So it's at this time where I'm at, University of Penn where I'm taking a class of American racism with a woman by the name of Roberta Everson. And the first thing I said was like, what can this white woman teach me? Uh, and she taught me so very much. Uh, there was an opportunity to take another professor who some of you who are viewing this may have heard of, Dr. Walter Palmer, who's a civil rights legend in, in, the, in the Philadelphia area. But Bobby Everson taught me a lot about myself. And then Dr. Schwartz was also a professor there. So I would spend time with Dr. Uh, Arthur Schwartz, I would spend time with Dr. Diane Metzendorf and they would talk to me about, you know, Jewish history and things of that nature. But uh, from an important perspective and from a strengths-based perspective, the way Jews and African-Americans had worked together during the civil rights and how powerful that was. And then we come to the era where I learned about Jesse Jackson making some comments while he was coming into New York on, uh, I think, a plane or a helicopter. He said, you know, we're hovering over Jaime Town. Uh, and then a lot of other challenges that you all are well aware of, we, we're aware of historically, that brings us to the contemporary moment. But then there was this epiphany. I would like to say the Holy Spirit provided me an opportunity to learn about an uh, organization by the name of Operation Understanding. Uh, and they needed a group leader. And I'm reading a flyer and I'm just like, oh, okay, an opportunity to be a group leader to take African American rising high school seniors and Jewish American rising high school seniors to Senegal as well as to Israel. And I said, oh, that's fascinating. Uh, and God provided an opportunity where everything was wiped off my schedule from a job perspective. I was just a lowly social worker at the time, uh, community social worker working for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, they actually gave me off that particular summer. It was very unique though, right? And uh, I'm not gonna make an apology here because I'm not an apologist, but my African-American supervisor did not want me to be off for the summer to go to Africa and Israel, but it was her supervisors Dr. Lorraine Katz, you see where I'm going, Dr. Terry Littman, Dr. Bob Berkowitz, Dr. Charles Stanley that were just like, hey, Chad, that's a fun, wonderful opportunity. That's a phenomenal opportunity. And they were not because they were Jewish trending on the Jewish side. They said, you're going to enjoy Africa. You're going to enjoy Israel. So it was the door of no return, which opened me up, connected me to, you know, the challenges with regards to the Black Holocaust. And then it was Yah Vashem. And I've shared this with Rabbi Glaser when I'm going to Yah Vashem, and I'm learning about the great intellect, Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein, and how, had they died in the, in, uh, in the Holocaust, we would have not had their great minds. And so that was eye-opening for me. And so then I realized, wait a minute, uh, theoretically and practically, suffering happens on every side of the color line. So I ended up coming back to Philadelphia, and from 2007 to this very moment that I'm on this 
uh, Zoom with you all against the backdrop of a tornado, depending on where you're at, tornado warning, it has been a growth process. Uh, in my community, uh, specifically in my home, not trying to out anyone in my home, my mother is a very fair-skinned woman. My brother was 6'9", born in Nuremberg, Germany in 1968, and he was light-skinned with curly hair. I was the dark one in the family. Colorism exists in our communities because of the notions uh, that white supremacy gives us, the hate that hate teaches and is manifested in ourselves. And my mom would say, I got, uh, uh, I got a, a she would label us like ice cream cones. I got a vanilla and I got a chocolate. And then when babies were born in our family, if they were dark, uh, family members say, that's a pretty chocolate baby, as opposed to that's just a beautiful baby. So the journey has been a continuation of just dealing with my forms of male privilege. I'm 6'6", six, six, uh, making sure that I deal with forms of toxic masculinity, make sure that I'm not actually uh, displaying with male privilege, that I'm not minimizing the voices of, of others, um, and also becoming a earnest and true friend with the Jewish community. Thank you. That was beautiful. Can you share with us um, your role, how you came to be executive director of the Human Relations Commission, how you view your work and what you're hoping to accomplish? Yes. Um, so I came into this work because right after I got my master's in social work from University of Penn in 2001, and uh, I graduated with five individuals from the School of Social Policy and Practice. Uh, I graduated tops in my class. Um, there were five of us who graduated who were African-American males, uh, and Mayor Rendell reached out to me and scheduled a meeting with uh, my, myself and the other four gentlemen and Senator Arlen Specter, may God rest his soul. Uh, and those of you who may know Senator Arlen Specter, he was big on mentoring programs for boys and uh, uh, big brothers, big sisters. So we met with him and he said, hey, listen, um, you all are you all from the same area? We say, yeah, we're all from Philadelphia with Ivy League degrees. Darren Toller, was, he was from West Philadelphia. I was from North Philadelphia. Derek Jackson, you know, he was from Southwest Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. He said, have you ever considered being uh, mentors? And we said, no, not really. Um, he said, you should consider it. Uh, we took it under advisement, but it wasn't until Dr. Walter Palmer said, why don't you establish an organization called the Black Men at Penn School of Social Work Incorporated. Well, that scares a lot of whites, right? Black, right? We should say African-American because when we hear anything black, it has a, a connotation because of our implicit, our explicit biases, or maybe because of our true white supremacist ideology. We didn't want to say African-American. We wanted to say black simply because it crosses over the diaspora. Uh, you have some folk who are Haitian that tell you, I'm not African-American, I'm Haitian, and rightfully so. So we organized the organization, Black Men at Penn School uh, uh, of Social Work Incorporated. And it wasn't to deal with uh, white supremacy, anything like that. We were concerned about the things that were trending in the African-American community, how sometimes there are young Black males who buy into their own victimization. And then I'm a researcher, so I was adding the high-level macro research aspect to it, where I would find qualitative and quantitative data that showed how you can have a father in the household and a mother, and you may not go to college, or you cannot have a father in the household, and your mother can be strung out on drugs. I don't want to paint a picture of pathology, and you can go on to Stanford, you can go to Cal Berkeley, because it's really about resiliency, a moral compass, a moral imperative, albeit structural, systemic oppression and inequality. So we started trending in that direction. Pull your pants up. Stop calling women bees, uh, specifically with white teachers. When Ms. Ludwig tells you to take your hat off and, and you know, take your hair phone, headphones off, why don't you listen? Why do we have to come in, into the classroom and tell you? Or why does some man at, that's African-American and, and that imagery have to tell you? Listen to her because she's a trusted adult. So we started trending on that level and we started trending around looking at the challenges of mass incarceration and its impact on families. We moved from there to recognize that we had to do anti-racism training in urban, suburban, as well as in rural schools. And so my work started there and then someone took a, a, a you know, it was like a prayer. Someone just prayed for me and then said, listen, we think that you would be good as a professor. I didn't have a PhD. So I started teaching courses on American racism and social work practice at the University of Penn and did that for four or five years uh, and then left there, went up to Westchester as a visiting scholar for about 11 years and then was the executive director at the Red Cross House, another level of, of service. Uh, let me pause here and say, I've never had a job. I've always had assignments by God. And so the next assignment was the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Whoa, wait a minute, what is that? Did some research around there, uh, around that. 
looked at it in the context of Barack Obama simply because when he became president, we were so quick to say we live in a post-racial society when we know post-racial is a mirage, looked at the current context of the current president and said, I'm a black kid from North Philadelphia, even though I've traveled the world uh, and spent time in Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm going to go to Harrisburg. Those of you remember when James Carville, the Democratic strategist for Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton said, you have Philadelphia, you have Pittsburgh, and in between you have Kentucky. Uh, but I ended up taking this assignment by God. Uh, I've been here for two years. Uh, and so everything that groomed me, the black church, coming out of the black church tradition, when Martin Luther King says the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The Jewish stuff that I've been reading about Rabbi Abraham Yahshua Heschel over the past 10 years, all of this stuff and all of these experiences, whether they've been good or indifferent, has put me in this moment right now where a kid from North Philadelphia is head of a civil rights agency uh, and, and is a top one in the Commonwealth. I don't think I can hear you. You're muted, Bob, yeah. Sorry, so I should just mention that my phone just told me there was a tornado warning. So if, if I'm a little distracted, you'll forgive me. Um, yeah, Chad, so we, we have now arrived at the present moment um, and it's a difficult moment. Okay. In 1960, let's make sure I get the year right. 67. 1967, right, the Commission on, the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, the Kerner Commission, was formed to investigate the reason for the 150 riots that had been happening across the country. And they determined, right, what, you know, they were, they were tasked to determine what happened, why did it happen, and what can prevent it from happening again. The report issued on February 29th of 1968. Right? Remember, Martin Luther King was killed at the beginning of March. February 9th, 29th of March 1968 blamed more than, more than 150 riots on white racism instead of American, African American political groups, like some believe. Specifically, it identified confrontations between predominantly white police forces and the predominantly African American communities they served. That's hard because that was in 1967 and here we are and it doesn't feel like a different space. Do you see, do you see that, th that anything has changed? Do you see any reasons for optimism? Where do we go from here? Great question. And, 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 and Rabbi, let's, let's be mindful to, before we leave, um, uh, give a quick uh, overview of what the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission is. I, 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 I skipped that so that our viewing audience can know. I think in context, that Kerner Commission that said that there are two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal, we can fast forward to the contemporary moment and we can borrow a little bit from W.E.B. Du Bois when he said the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. What Du Bois was saying is that the problem in America is white supremacy. Uh, for everyone that's viewing this, Hear what I'm saying. That's not an indictment against white people. Uh, what Du Bois was simply saying is that the power structure of institutional racism are policies. If you remember the first 12 presidents of the United States, as astute as they were, as intellectual as they were, as brilliant as they were, they also owned slaves. The first 12 presidents of the United States own slaves. Uh, I, I carry around, I don't have it on me now, a, a book called Civility. It's a book by, uh, you know, uh, Ben Franklin. And, and what it talks about is like, if you sneeze or a woman sneeze, hand her a handkerchief. I just, I love it. I've also read the autobiography of Ben Franklin because he's, he's a scholar. But when Du Bois was talking about that, he was simply saying that black people, when he did the Philadelphia Negro, the first epidemiological, uh, sociological study of black life here in, six, uh, in, in, in the Sixth Ward, uh, he was saying that black people have problems, but they are not the problem. America will have you to believe, and it seduces you into race, and in believing that black people are the problem. And so the Kerner Commission talked about riots, the same things that we had then, we have now, uh, aspects of it. 
We had educational apartheid then, we have educational apartheid now. We had American apartheid with the construction of, of the ghettos and segregation, we have that now. Deep rates of poverty, we can do a correlation to now. What a lot of people don't know is that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was also a fair housing advocate who left the South, came up to the tenement squares in mm -hmm. Chicago and lived in those tenement squares and said, wait a minute, I, I see the same challenges that I saw down South that I see up here up North. So when the Kerner Commission came out, people wanted to be in denial about that, right? But then why do we have Brown versus Board of Education? Why did we, why did we have to push for legislation with regards to institutional racism with the B Montgomery bus boycott? And so that Kerner Commission was similar to where we're at now. Civil disobedience, nonviolence, I come out of that King tradition, has always existed. Uh, Jews have always pledged their lives, if we look at the civil rights movement to, to now, around efforts to show full humanity um, of, of, of African Americans. But what we had was institutional racism, and yes, it's polarizing for people to hear, white racism. White racism, white violence, right? And that's, once again, not an indictment, but nowhere historically can you give me a group of African Americans who have engaged in the reign of terror like the Ku Klux Klan. Or, and we, and we do know we have African Americans who are demagogues and are anti-Semitic, and we know what those organizations are. But what I'm talking about is this reign of terror. So the riots were, once again, when King articulated in context, it's very important to, to, to look at context that riots are the language of the unheard. Because in this contemporary era, people will say, yeah, King said riots are the, the, uh, are, are the language of the unheard. I'm not sure King would tinker on what we're seeing now, but we'll get to that. So during that era, what you had was uh, forms of disadvantage, structural inequality. It gave rise to the Black Panthers. But remember, ever since Amer Africans have been t were stolen from Africa as, as human beings and brought to Africa, turned into slaves, it's always been a suspicion and surveillance of them. Harriet Tubman was free in slaves, but because of menticide, you had a lot of slaves at the time who would go and tell on Harriet Tubman, i.e. snitching. And so Harriet Tubman would say, she stated, I freed thousands of slaves and would have freed thousands of more had they only known that they were slaves. Um, and, and if I messed up that quote, I apologize. So what we had was the surveillance and the suspicion of black bodies. Folk were locked out of the economy. You had economic injustice, environmental racism. You had people violating the Fair Housing Act. And so during that time, it was turbulent. And then the leaders during that time were being killed, right? I mean, we, in, in that era, we, we didn't, we've never witnessed someone like Robert Kennedy, you know, get murdered right on television. John F. Kennedy get murdered right on television. And then you also didn't just have Martin Luther King, you had uh, El Hajj Malik Shabazz. We don't leave him in the role of Malcolm X when he was anti-Semitic. He goes to Mecca and recognizes that people with the pellets of skin, with the bluest of eyes, were also human beings as well. But we also had the killing of Megar Evers, and then we had the Mississippi burning of the two Jewish brothers who lost their lives. So the Kerner Commission was very revealing. And then here we are in 2020. Here we are in 2020, and you have educational apartheid, environmental racism, economic injustice, uh, and what you also have is the killing of black people rendered disposable in our democracy. Whiteness provides an opportunity for the mob to be protected, but not those who get mobbed. And so it's convenient how some white officers are able to take white perps alive. So let's look at George Floyd really quick. Uh, he gets arrested for a fake $20 bill. Well, maybe he didn't know it was counterfeit. Well, let's say it was counterfeit. Should not cost him his life. Bernie Madoff, he swindled. We talk about looting. Bernie Madoff looted millions of dollars. He goes to prison. We talk about looting. Our democracy has been looted by the oligarchs, the politocrats on, in Wall Street, as well as the robber barons and the carpetbaggers. So then we come back to George Floyd. Horrifying to hear, you know, I can't breathe for the second time when we heard Eric Garner say the same thing. But we don't focus on the other two things that he said. He called out for his mother. And I'm not trying to be racially uh, uh, satire here, but he said, mama. And then he said to the officer, I don't want to die. Let's let that sit for a minute in our spirits. I don't want to die. 
the cop didn't see his humanity because a lot of officers are similar to the overseers on the plantation. They are officers and overseers as an occupying terroristic force, paramilitary terroristic force, and communities. They occupy our communities. The officer himself is a human being, but he didn't see the humanity of a, another individual. Hand in his pocket looked like he was getting gratification out of the killing. So where are people at now? 35 million people are out of work on every side of the color line. A pandemic that keeps people in their homes except for those who have essential uh, uh, responsibilities. Not speaking for those of you on the call, but I'm privileged, not because I work at PHRC, but I telework. I get a check. This Friday, I'm going to get a check. I get sick, I got health insurance. But we have people who are broken. They were already broken because of the experiences of white racism, because of the experiences of white violence. We hear black on black violence, and that occurs, but it's a myth, the terminology. People kill people that they're in close proximity to. Whites kill whites, blacks kill blacks, Asians kill Asians, Latinos kill Latinos. And so when we say the Kerner Commission revisit in the 21st century, there's still police brutality, there's still economic injustice, there's, there's still high rates of poverty. I'm not pessimistic, I'm not optimistic, I am a prisoner of hope. Why am I a prisoner of hope? Because I know that there are good people of good faith. I'm not talking religiosity, or spirituality, but there are good people of good faith like you and people on this call. And the challenge that we have in the African-American community, we act as if Jewish people, white people and others are not mourning the same thing. And so you all as, as Jews, sometimes you have a hard time saying, hey, I'm sorry about what happened because your black friends, your black family members, your black colleagues will say, you don't know my pain. No, but I don't have to know your pain. But guess what? As a Jewish person, put your arm around me and say, hey, Chad, hang in there. I'm sad that this occurred. And if I say, get off of me, you don't know what, what's going on. Chad, you need this hug. I'm not going to let go. Nowhere in the history of that example have I ever get, that I just provided has a black person said, get off of me and got into a fight with a Jewish person. And so I believe that what we have seen is this aspect of blacks, Jews, whites, everyone pledging themselves together across America. But we've also seen what we call white supremacist interlopers and Asian provocateurs and fascists who have integrated themselves will throw a Bernie Molly cocktail and hide behind a sign that says no justice, no peace. And our young people, not putting them down, a lot of them are not emotionally uh, able to decipher what's going on. So they trend and they go to a Foot Locker and then they, they break into a piano store in Chestnut Hill, uh, Chestnut Street, and they play the piano. They don't want the piano. Uh, and we see an uh, uncivilized society. So where do we go from here? Yeah, I actually love that, the phrase of prisoner of hope. That's really beautiful. Um, hope's, hope's been complicated lately. Yeah, it um, has. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to back up is just say, for those of you, um, please tweet me, not for Twitter followers, but so that we can continue this dialogue. I'm, I'm at, uh, at Chad Lasseter, at C-H-A-D. L-A-S-S-I-T-R on Twitter. Um, I would be disingenuous, Rabbi, uh, to you, to your audience, and to my very own humanity to articulate where I think we go from here. I would be placating everyone. I would be uh, displaying with false generosity, and I would be disingenuous. Uh, one of the things that I think needs to happen is, in context, we have to realize that civil disturbances um, in context occur. Anger is real and anger is justified. But out of the King tradition of civil disobedience, nonviolence, I believe that it has to be coalition building on the Jewish side and on all sides of the color line. I think we have a unifying moment. I think that's what you, uh, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, all of the other rabbis and just everyone who has been a part of not this evening, but have been trending with this whole entire series that you've put together. We have a unifying moment to look at our humanity I think the black white binary is essential because uh, if we look at black humanity, we see black people as humans, uh, then we can understand what they're going through. Uh, when, when, when Baldwin talks about to be a Negro in America is to always be in a constant state of rage, I think that's real. I think frank conversations on white racism and white violence needs to occur. Uh, and I think that whites uh, can also be part of those conversations. You don't have to be Joe Fagan. You don't have to be Paul Kivel, who had, wrote the book Uprooting Racism. You don't have to be David T. Wellman, who wrote the book 
uh, Portraits of White Racism. You don't have to, the new book that trans be anti-racist. Uh, that's good. At the end of the day, uh, we could talk about allyship. My grandmother would say, just be a good person. <laughs> Dr. Arthur Schwartz would just say, just be a good person. Um, I think we have to continue to be uncomfortable with having these conversations around race and racism. I think we have to address the suspicion uh, and the surveillance of black bodies. But I was encouraged by what happened today in Minnesota under Attorney General uh, Keith Ellison uh, and the white governor. I was encouraged by the white mayor who came out and said he understands the 400 years of oppression that black people are living with. Uh, what we saw today was we saw the amended complaint uh, for a stronger charge. We also saw how linguistically Attorney General Ellison mentioned we're bringing in the other former police officers. That was a paradigm shift from their identity. They are no longer police officers. When you engage in that type of barbaric behavior, even if you sit by silently, you're complicit. He talked about justice and he talked about co be a collaboration. And I think we have a collaborative moment where as African Americans and Jews, we can have a collaborative struggle for the humanity of African Americans. That means that we know from a position of power, we have influential people on every side of the color line. How can we influence policy? How can we do a writing letter campaign to say, we're gonna to try to address some of these disparities in the criminal just us system uh, and bring justice for all? How are we going to not just march and protest, but similar to the civil rights movement, lay it on the line? Um, and I think that there's a lot of other things uh, that we can do. We can join organizations, we can join groups, uh, we can promote those organizations that are working. That's why when I met you and, and, and several others who were in, in this Zoom from the Anti-Defamation League, uh, we have to be willing to, to listen, we have to be willing to learn. But I think that beyond listening and learning and having a kumbaya, touchy-filly, we shall overcome tiptoe through the tulips moment, we have to be real with ourselves that uh, racism exists. And we also need the African-American community to trend when anti-Semitism occurs. So when the killing at the Tree of Life occurred, I understand that, and I learned this, that the Jewish community is a very close-knit community. So I had to push through some things with some lead, Jewish leaders in, in, in Pittsburgh. They didn't know me. They just simply said, well, we, we have a therapeutic interventionists. We do it in this tradition. And I had to learn that. But I did get out to the P Pittsburgh Seminary School, and we had a conference, and, and I was talking about some of these things around anti-Semitism. And so I think we have to all be on the same page. And then we have to deal with our own isms, right? We have to be comfortable uh, as an African-American. If someone said, you know, Chad, you have some explicit, explicit bias, implicit and explicit biases, um, I have to be comfortable with that. We have to be comfortable when someone says, hey, you might be trending um, as a racist, and it doesn't mean that they're trying to say that, you know, uh, they're negating your humanity. Um, and we have to be so comfortable to sit with that and not think, oh, they're being anti-Semitic because they called me out on a form of effective uh, prejudice, a form of, you know, uh, discrimination. We all have those things. Um, I think there are lots of things that we can do. Uh, and I know that this is not the last time that we're going to be talking about that. But those are just things that, that come to mind. Coalition building, uh, we have to fund organizations. We have to fund organizations that are doing the work. I'm not, I'm not going to get caught up in the dichotomy of Black Lives Matter and all that, but there are some really great organizations out here. So for instance, really briefly, when you talk about the PHRC, we were created in 1955. We have 11 commissioners, six are, are, are Democrats, five are Republicans. We have three regional offices, one in Pittsburgh, one in Harrisburg, one in Philadelphia. Uh, we have a complement of 96 great individuals. Uh, we receive complaints from all 67 counties. Our website is www.phrc.com. Uh, we enforce state laws that prohibit discrimination. Our PHRA, which is our Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, it covers discrimination in employment, housing, commercial property, education, public accommodation, and the law prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religious creed, uh, ancestry, age, sex, national origin, familial status, handicap or disability, uh, support of guide animals, as well as retaliation for filing complaints. Uh, we take complaints in from the EEOC as well as from HUD, but we don't just process cases. We launched a no hate in our state town hall on the hills of the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan down in York. Uh, at our first town hall, 
a gentleman who identified himself as the Grand Dragon from Hershey wanted to speak. And I said, come up and speak. Much to the dismay of a lot of my staff who were in attendance that night and about 56 people who murmured, oh, don't let him speak. I said, no, we have to see his humanity as well. I wasn't trying to First Amendment rights, freedom of speech. I actually saw his humanity, albeit wretched uh, and white supremacist, but I saw his humanity nonetheless. So I, I know the community wants to be able to ask questions if you enter them into the chat. Um, now, will you, will you see them? Because I'm afraid to touch it and look at the chat and then something happened. I'm not good with technology at all. All right. I got it. People okay. type it in. I read it out. Um, now, the, Rosa, is that a question or is it a, just a comment? It's, it's just a comment, but it, it can be um, talked about. All right. So I'm going to read. Ro Rosa, would you like to read your comment? Sure. Go ahead. You want to read it yourself? Oh, I can read it. Um, I believe that we need more daily experiences like the ones Mr. Lassiter had growing up of living next to a white Jewish woman, because if we only wait to have a dialogue when things explode, then there is too much anger without understanding of who we really are. We need more moments of getting to know our, our shared humanities on a daily basis. Society here does not allow for interracial interactions. Blacks go to their neighborhoods on bus, whites go to their to theirs in cars, and we don't serve each, and, and we don't serve each other. We don't get to know each other. Yeah, I, I would say I would say absolutely right. Um, I, I shared with Rabbi Glaser that towards the tail end of his life, my dad actually was trending with a group called Messianic Jews, and we would go to Seder's. And my dad had a lot of Jewish friends towards the tail end of his life. He died in 1999 of a massive heart attack. But when we would go to the Seder's, there was one particular kid that found, I believe, the ritual or the symbolism is uh, you find the matzah bread, and it was I, I believe that's right. And I think the kid had found it two years in a row. My dad told his Jewish colleagues, he said, I think the fix is in. So it was the first time I had an experience uh, in that type of setting. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, we're kind of closed off and we need to really embrace one another because there's strength in learning about one another. Uh, I think it strengthens our democracy and it strengthens just who we are as human beings. Rebecca, did you wanna to ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Chad. Thanks so much for, for this. This is wonderful. Um, as, a, as a white Jewish female who was admittedly brought up in very much a white bubble, um, how do I recognize racism in myself? I, I, I feel so strongly that, um, you know, that I need to be self-reflective and, and start, as you said, just with myself. Sometimes it's even hard to know when you're being racist? <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great question. I, I think that we, we all go through that. I think it's a, a transformation process. I think that it's an ever learning process. You know, um, I stopped being homophobic maybe about 20 years ago, but uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I might've been trending with, you know, male privilege when, you know, a female in my family may have said something and I ended up taking over the conversation and maybe talking about a woman's reproductive rights instead of just listening to what they had to say. So I think that it, it, it's a process. I, I, one of the ways that helped me through my journey is journaling those times where I might have engaged in a stereotype uh, or a, a form of prejudice. I think that there are books uh, that are out there that can help us. But I think actually it's just, you know, going through trial and error and not thinking that you have to live with Jewish guilt or white guilt um, because sometimes that happens in the African-American community. When you all come and you trend into a group with African-Americans, people say, you know, or you all sometimes will put up the own, your own barriers. You'll say, I'm going to go to this meeting. I'm not going to say anything. I, you know, I'm not going to take over because I don't want anyone thinking that if I say something, I'm trying to take over the meeting and I'm engaging in white privilege. I think sometimes you, you go to the meeting and you say what you need to say if it's earnest. And if you know you're not operating from that space, when African-Americans push back and say, here you go again, trying to take over, you say, actually, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm a human being that just happens to be white and Jewish. And I have, I have some thoughts to what you were saying because I've had that experience before. So I think it's an ever evolving thing. 
uh, I don't have a particular answer because your context is your context. I think the thing that you're bringing with that question is you want to unlearn some biases. And I think all of us, when we leave out of here today, we need to just breathe. We need to just breathe and recognize that some of the things that are embedded in us are not true. So really, really quick, uh, when I was working at the W.E.B. Du Bois Collective Research Institute at University of Penn, I would get on the elevator at the first floor and, and the office that I was at at 3440 Market Street was on the six, seventh floor. Uh, white people would get on the elevator and they would say, hey, wow, you're tall, do you play basketball? And my racial protective factor was, no, I'm into equestrian. And they would say, what kind of horses? And I would say, uh, Arabian horses. Uh, and that would always be my protective factor until one day, uh, a white woman got on the elevator. She said, whoa, you're really tall. Do you play basketball? I said, no, I'm into equestrian. She said, uh, what kind of horses? I said, Arabian. She said, what kind of breed? I said, I play basketball. <laughs> you know, I just got tired of those racial protective factors. Uh, so I think we just continue to be authentic as best as we possibly can. We monitor our behavior and it's okay for a black friend or a Jewish friend to call us out on our forms of prejudice. Um, uh, I don't know if this is Akil or Jasmine, but would you like to ask your question? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes. How are you this evening? <coughs> I'm good. How about yourself, man? It's good Hang to it uh, Hang in tough. Hang in tough. My question is, how do Jews of color fit into this narrative? Like, what can we do? To, uh, to bridge the gap? That's a great question. And I, I'm going to push back and say, I'm not a Jew of color. <laughs> I think it's a good question. But there's there's a, a an amazing rabbi. Um, and I hope my, my good friend uh, is on here too, because he, he's become a dear brother by the name of David Edelman. He started an organization called the Alliance. And, and there's a, a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Earl Bowen. Um, I, I would be disingenuous to try to say what Jews of color can do. I think Rabbi uh, Earl Bowen uh, and others uh, who trend um, as, as Jews of color can, can talk more about that. And then also uh, because of this technology and this phenomenon where you all can chat one another, I'm certain that someone uh, can, can speak to that. I saw uh, something come up on the screen about um, books. And yes, there's, there are several books um, that, that can come about that people need to read. I think people certainly need to read Dr. Naeem Akbar, Akbar's Breaking the Psychological Chains of Slavery, anything by W.E.B. Du Bois, everything by Dr. Martin Luther King, in particular, Taylor Branch's three trilogies. Uh, I think uh, Race Matters and Democracy Matters by Cornel West. Uh, for, for, for us, as uh, those of you at, uh, who are Jewish, George Fredrickson's Short History of Racism. Uh, that's Jorg Fredrickson's Short History of Racism that talks about Jewish persecution uh, and racism towards Jews. Uh, I think that's a great book. Uh, you have uh, several other books, um, and we can definitely uh, send over a book list uh, of just things. Anything by Peggy McIntosh. Um, she doesn't have a book, but uh, she has some great stuff. Anything by Joe Fagan uh, that looks at white, white privilege, uh, systems of inequality. That'd be great. So, Chad, if you could share that book list with me, we'll send it out to everyone who registered. Okay. Um, yeah, if I can j just jump in for one second. Is that all right? Well, oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Sorry, so I'm, um, Akhil, I'll say um, as your rabbi that um, I think one thing that is just vital is for, for you and for everyone in the congregation, regardless of race, to, um, to bring your whole self and to speak your truth and share your stories and your experience. Because I think you know, that, that certainly within our synagogue community helps us understand each other. And I think that you and the other Jews of color in our community are an important bridge um, in the sense that you, you live first person in the Jewish community and in the Black community, and um, you know, and, and your witness to that um, in a way that I think is is incredibly valuable and meaningful. And I think you know, wherever that comes up for you, in classes or in social settings or or what have you, um, that I I would love to just know that you feel like you can speak your whole truth in any of those contexts. 
Shana, would you like to read your question? Uh, sorry. <laughs> I had not my... at all. I didn't mean to sneak up on you. Okay, hold on. Uh, am I up? Can you hear me? Oh. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I am wondering, and I've been uh, sort of engaged in, in this practice for a while, and Rory Michelle just um, commented with some, some feedback, but where I've been for the past week and a half and, you know, for quite some time before that is how to respond to and engage in the um, with people who don't see themselves, right? They don't self-identify as racist, but they say, you know, Black Lives Matter as a statement is racist. Why don't we say all lives matter? And uh, what was another um, example I put in here? Um, oh, that the concept of, of white privilege is racist in and of itself, and it doesn't exist. Um, another one that I've been seeing a lot lately is quoting Martin Luther King out of context. Um, and there's a certain back and forth, you know, I find myself wanting to engage on Facebook as a platform because I know, you know, I used to be the BZ, the USY advisor at BZBI, which is the um, teen youth group movement for conservative Judaism. And, you know, some of those kids are, are my friends on Facebook. And I want them to see that, you know, you can have um, conversations with decorum and, and engage back and forth. And sometimes you come to an agreement, sometimes people are misunderstood, um, but, but that's not always the case. And at what point, you know, there's this other tendency now towards cancel culture. And I don't like you, we don't agree, so I'm going to unfriend you. I'm going to stop shopping from that vendor, et cetera. Um, so, what is your um, advice on how to engage, how to be productive, and when to call it quits? Thank you. Yeah, uh, great question and, and, and wonderful framework. Um, I want to unpackage the aspect about what you said about Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I think on all sides of the color line, and specifically because of white supremacy and white racism, uh, we try to cl uh, uh, clean Dr. Martin Luther King up. He goes from Time Magazine Man of the Year towards the tail end of his life as the most vilified American with COINTELPRO, uh, you know, suspicious of his every move, the surveillance of his body. Uh, and every, everything that he did, was, there was an attempt to undermine him. Uh, we, don't, we talk about King as this I have a dream speech, uh, but we always use the convenient part of that. The first several paragraphs were revolutionary, radical and revolutionary in and of itself. King talked about the triple evils, poverty, racism, and militarism. What is destroying our democracy right now? Poverty, racism, and militarism, and the police state, and the industrial prison complex. And so I think these conversations have to be frank and earnest, and I don't have a sophisticated response to your eloquently stated question, other than I apply the three Ws. Some will get it, some won't get it, so what? I just don't have time to continue to debate with people on social media and my family. Uh, I had church members at Triumph Baptist Church who believes that the challenge in Philadelphia is black on black violence. You always on Fox News. You're always spouting off this. You're always writing op ed piece, pieces. Why don't you say something about brothers killing brothers? That's internalized oppression. I said, why don't you take France Fanon's Black Skin White Mask or Wretched of the Earth to recognize the concept of internalized oppression? Oppressed people begin to mimic the behavior of the oppressed, oppressor. And that's why you see this killing of one another because society has taught you, you better not trend on that side of the color line. It'll cost you your life. But we see cops getting off with state-sanctioned violence with impunity against black bodies. And so I, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound dismissive, uh, you can still say, some will, some won't, so what, in that beloved community, Martin Luther King way. Uh, but King, once again, said that the greatest purveyor of violence is my own United States government. That's King. We never look at that statement by King. We enter into violence trending in this direction on the black side of the color line. King talked about imperialism, colonialism, capitalism. 
King talked about the Vietnam War. That's the military industrial complex. That's what caused King his life. So it's the tail end of his life. King said, I think I'm integrating my people into a burned building. So you will build your community with people who will earnestly challenge you and you have to challenge them on their racism. Those who are not willing to unlearn how they've been racially socialized will continue to be who they are and they shouldn't be part of your circle. I fundamentally believe, uh, but only you know where your pulse is with them and how much your Waterloo level or your spiritual being, who you are as a spiritual being can take. Some people have individuals who've been in their circle for a period of time and they're still racist people, even though they see that you're trending to dismantle the structure of inequality. I, I hope some semblance of, of that helps you. Um, I think we can start with all, all people, black and white and Jews and everyone else about an accurate rendering of who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was. And that I have a dream speech, he talked about, I refuse to believe that the, the vaults of democracy are bankrupt, has given me a check mark insufficient funds. He was talking about reconstruction, the promise of 40 acres and a mule. And that's his King was talking about reparations. Thank you. And, and I actually want to suggest on a, on a practical level, I want to support your, um, your inclination to call out racism when it pretends it's not, right? That idea that you can't say oh, black lives matter. The truth is for all lives to matter, black lives have to matter. Right? We need to say black lives matter. The idea that you don't see race is actually you, something you yeah, you're absolutely right, Rabbi. Uh, really quick before we go to the next question, I, I saw a meme on Facebook. You can learn a lot of teachable things in a moment from Facebook where someone said, that's like going to uh, a benefit for cancer and simply saying, you know, something like, you know, diabetes matters. It does. But right now we're talking about breast cancer. So Black Lives Matter is, once again, come on, let's put the racial elephant in the room. Black Lives Matter is not a radical group in the sense that people want to say. They have not systematically enslaved anyone. They have not lynched anyone. They have not killed anyone. Um, uh, you know, Colin Kaepernick took a knee to bring attention to the anthology of police brutality. We're mad at the peaceful demonstration, but not the anthology of the situation that led him to do it. And I want to say something as we go to the next person. I'm very clear, too, in my role. That's why I say it's not a job, it's an assignment. Because folk will say, Chad, you said that the president is a white supremacist and there's a white supremacist agenda that, st that was started with Steve Bannon to bring you know, the democracy to the context that is on the brink of collapse. I could say that on Monday, but on Friday, someone would say, Chad, we got to let you go. But I just said the same thing on Monday. Yeah, but it sounded a little differently. We're mad at the agitators. But Frederick Douglass told us, agitate, agitate, agitate. So as Jews, agitate, agitate, agitate. As human beings, Agitate, 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 and hopefully, you know, it won't trend where we lose our jobs and the cancel culture that you were so eloquently talking about. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I hate to, be such, these are such beautiful and passionate speeches that I'm giving you little, little quips to say back. So, but I'm just going to give you another one. When someone says you they don't say, see race, they mean they don't see racism. Right. And when someone says that, that, that white idea of white privilege is racist, it, it's the same thing, the refusal to see racism. And that doesn't make you more open-minded, it just makes you, uh, yeah, let's not even go there. Yeah, I, I, I don't like the colorblind uh, society theory. Chat, when I see you, I don't see black men, I see human beings. You gotta see me as a black man. I, I'm a black man, and there's nothing wrong with being a black man. There's nothing wrong with being anything, you know? And so that colorblind uh, aspect is, I'm not racist. I have one black friend, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, I would also say that it's okay to be racist. Uh, don't use it uh, as a form of superiority to harm someone and kill them. Uh, but at some point, let's move from being a racist to unlearning racism. That's just a theory of mine. People may disagree uh, because here's the reality. People are already racist. <laughs> People are already prejudiced. People are already bigots. People already discriminate. Um, but how can you unlearn those processes over a period of time? Um, so 
So some of these are comments, not so much questions, and they're beautiful comments, but we're going to shorten things a little bit. Right? How can we act on our solidarity today and expand it to all struggles for liter liberation and freedom? Sorry uh, very, for shortening, Hannah. Yeah, very, very sophisticated question. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission is uh, implement something called race dialogue on college campuses uh, with black and Jewish students. We're going to be using University of Penn. We're going to be using Drexel University and several other universities as a model. I think also is the work that uh, all of you rabbis are doing already. And then it's the work that others are doing with the formation of whether it's Alliance and David and his team, various other things. I think we have some existing structures uh, already in place your structure with, with the Jewish Federation, uh, the structure with the Anti-Defamation League. I think that there are some things where if we want to recreate the will, we can, uh, but we can also integrate ourselves into the uh, already existing organizations. I think some of, some of you may want to look at uh, when there's an opening on a board for the Urban League. Uh, the Urban League here in Philadelphia, the Urban League historically was started by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and a Jewish woman, uh, Jane Covington. It was the Niagara Movement, and then it became the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that was the NWCP, but you know, there are organizations that you can join um, and that you can sit on uh, even as Jewish people. And then there are organizations that you all have that we need to integrate ourselves into. Uh, I know that there are some uh, of our colleagues from the Anti-Defamation League who are, who are part of this. When I first got to the state, they were the first ones that reached out to me. I'm gonna say that again. They were the first ones that reached out to me. They were not, it was not the black clergy of Harrisburg. It was not the NWCP uh, in the state. It was the ADL, and I went to their office. The second person who reached out to me was Hank Butler, uh, the executive director of uh, the Pennsylvania Jewish Coalition. The third person was the black clergy. The fourth person was Rabbi Glaser. So go figure. You know, if we get caught up in this color line thing, um, we're, we're not going to be able to move forward um, to build coalitions. Okay, and I know we're going to spend some time after the call where um, Rabbi Abe is going to talk a little bit about what PZBI is planning for the future. Is that correct, Dave? Sorry, I, it was a little noisy here. Can you ask that again? The, you, we're going to spend some time afterward talking about what BZBI is looking at going forward. Uh, no, I, I mentioned it briefly. Mentioned the follow-ups are going to be um, after the discussion tonight. Uh, we're going to hold a brief service for people who want to spend some time in prayer and reflection. Oh wow! I, I just wanted to, to mention because people are typing into the chat. People are typing suggestions into books. Um, I'm sure everyone will have a chance to look at that. A lot of interest in reading together and discussing together, as Abe mentioned, that BZBI will be doing. So, someone, Rabbi, asked, you know, Chad, before we conclude, two take-home points. I think there's a lot of take-home points, um, but the two that I can, can give, um, and you may not think that it can move things, um, it's not a theoretical model, it's not rooted in pseudo-intellectualism, but understand racial trauma in context. Um, and, and, and I think understanding racial trauma in context is very helpful. Uh, when I heard that uh, my chairman of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission Joel Bolstein had a lineage of 22 rabbis in his family, and that there was a similar uh, Jewish underground railroad that was able to get Jews out and, you know, during the persecution and the fleeing. Um, I had to look at him differently. I didn't just look at him as just like, you know, um, a guy that's, you know, okie dokie or anything like that. I looked at him, I could have probably found a better adjective, but I, I looked at him in full humanity and began to learn about you know his experiences and, and what that meant and and you know he'd start talking to me about the Torah and his family that's passed down and things of that nature. So I think understanding racial trauma and context on all sides and I think that's the intersectionality and the black white binary. But the black white binary serves as a purpose for us to understand Asian American Pacific Islander struggles, Native American Indigenous struggles, uh, Latino struggles, uh, struggles of LGBT and others. I think the other thing is <clears throat> attack racism. Uh, from a policy perspective. Uh, I'm not concerned about uh, a cop calling me the N-word. I'm concerned about the N-treatment. Uh, what that officer did to George Floyd was worse than calling someone the N-word. That was the N-treatment. That was the N-word treatment. That was the, the, the grading of a person, the humanizing of a person. So I believe uh, some takeaways based on what I saw in the chat, understand racial trauma and context, attack racism from a policy perspective, uh, we have to make sure that 
We do writing letter campaigns that we use our, 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 our white skin privilege uh, on behalf of black humanity as it relates to the criminal justice system, uh, criminal justice reform, things of that nature. And then the third thing, which has been a thread throughout this entire uh, evening's conversation is a takeaway is coalition building. It's, it's very clear that uh, we're stronger in numbers when we see the humanity of one another. African-Americans need to trend on the side of, of Jewish Americans when anti-Semitism is happening. And it doesn't have to be tree of life, but those jokes that we say in our African-American community and our African-American homes, those deeply embedded stereotypes about Jews and things of that nature, we need to call those things out as African-Americans. And if it causes us losing our, our brother or our sister, uh, well, then we need to lose them. Um, what I mean by that is we need to disassociate with people, even if they're in our family, who engage in hate. The question becomes, are Jews willing to do the same thing? When there are Jews amongst you who may have a deeply embedded stereotype, and you're like, well, no, that's not all Blacks. Because I've been in environments where people say, well, Chad, you're different from the rest of those individuals. The rest of them, how? <laughs> you know, we're not a monolith, you know, uh, but in fact, we are humans. So I would say those are some take homes. And then we're, we can work on some takeaways. Um, I think ultimately the last thing I'll say about that is it has to be a call of action. We have to call the powers to be to a place where they will do right by all people. Um, but at this particular point in time, uh, we know in America it's been protracted with 400 years of racial trauma. Fran, do you want to ask your question next? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chad. I, I'm very concerned about the police in Philadelphia, and I saw them using the tear gas on Route 676 to clear people away, and their history with the 300 police who were fired with the Facebook uh, posts and whatnot. And do you think that, have you been asked to get involved with the new chief of police outlaw? Have you met with her and have, have you been involved with anything to do with the Philadelphia police and uh, have you been engaged with them? Have you been that, asked? That's, <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have not, not, not with her. Um, when Mayor Michael Nutter was the, the mayor, um, I chaired his reentry transition team, his prison transition team. I was on the board of trustees for eight years, board of trustees Philly prisons for eight years and board of trustees for community college for six years. So I've had good relationships with former police commissioner, Charles Ramsey, uh, former commissioner, um, Richard Ross, aside from the sexual harassment stuff. And I don't want to dismiss that. Um, I don't want to uh, minimize that, but I had a great relationship with him. I've known him ever since I was a young kid. Um, his dad eulogized my brother. His dad is one of the deacons at my church. I just give you that for context because when Outlaw got here, um, I, wanted, I wanted to meet with her as the head of the top civil rights enforcement agency, not from a egotistical standpoint that I mentioned that, um, but you know, uh, they always gave me someone in between. Um, and then yesterday, Senator Vince Hughes, uh, he held a meeting, I've known him since high school. All these people just seem to be in these positions for a long time. Maxine Waters, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, everybody, right? <laughs> we gotta train the next generation, pass that mantle along that Martin Luther King wasn't able to do because he was assassinated. But uh, she wasn't on the call yesterday, but her, her first, her deputy chief in, 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 in command was, and a lot of people were asking just that question that you were talking about, the over-policing um, and the struggles that are in the community, you know, um, people are taking a peaceful protest, um, and, and why, why are we shooting them with tear gas uh, and things of that situation? Um, I think that, that becomes a challenge. I do plan, though, as a, as a commission, along with our commissioners, to get a meeting with her, um, you know, uh, I do, it's ironic that I'm from Philadelphia, right? I think your question is just brilliant. I'm from Philadelphia and I can meet with police chiefs in Carlisle and Hazleton and Erie and Pittsburgh and, and Link Lancaster, but in Philadelphia I can't get a meeting, but I'm a, I'm a prisoner of hope that we'll get a meeting. What I've seen similar to you is very disturbing with, with the tear gas. It's, it reminds me of, and then when I heard that the National Guard was coming in, it ended up taking me back uh, and, and a lot of you are much wiser than me. That's a kind way of saying much older. Um, you know, it, it takes us back to Kent State. Right. Um, you know, uh, Kent State and, and South Carolina State and North Carolina A and T. And so I was I was terribly frightened. Uh, but I did share an ending with Senator Vince Hughes that it's, it's time for him to convene a meeting with her and the PHRC Commission, uh, simply because 
uh, under our Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, one of our, our statutes is that we have to monitor civil unrest. So there could be people that can bring complaints to us because of forms of police brutality. So it's very important that they hear from our perspective because we are also not just an enforcing agency, we're a law enforcement agency as well. Steve? Uh, first, I wanna say, uh, I wanna say thank you, uh, Chad. Uh, you are truly a, a fount of, of wisdom and knowledge and experience. Um, and this has been an extraordinary session. I also want to thank Rabbi Bacha and JCRC and uh, Rabbi Abe and BZBI for hosting and sponsoring this session, which has really been uh, remarkable. Um, Chad, you mentioned uh, the, the issue of legacy and, and, and history, and I want, to, I want to push that question uh, or ask a question further about that. Um, what would you say are the, um, the most significant or, or harmful aspects, both past and present, in terms of uh, Jews' racism towards Blacks, number one. And number two, what the same question, you know, what are the most uh, significant, uh, harmful, dangerous aspects, expressions of, of Black anti-Semitism, uh, both past and present? Man, that, that's a great question. Um, as I've done throughout, uh, first let me say thank you for, for the more than, than kind sentiments. Um, I found them very touching. And also let me simply say that um, I feel like this has been a safe space uh, for me throughout, um, and, and I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Um, you know, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I, for me, when I look at it, I'll start with the latter and go to the former. Um, my history with regards to uh, the, the anti-Semitism and the racism towards Jews from Blacks uh, tends to be not limited, but I'm very aware, and I'll say it on this call, uh, so if there are any African Americans on this call, I will use my male privilege to protect me if anybody want to come after me for this, but just be mindful, I don't know how to fight. <laughs> I'm a big teddy bear. Uh, but I'm aware of, you know, the anti-Semitism that has come from the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan. Um, it's been vitriol, it's been anti-Semitic, and it has been anti-Semitic for a period of time. And I'm okay as an African American to stand alone for people to say, oh yeah, but they cleaned up uh, the projects. Or, you know, when you come out of jail uh, and you come to, you know, the mosque, uh, this is what they've done. They've been able to recreate new identities for black men. Uh, you, I hear that, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't buy that um, in that sense, right? That's good, right? But the, the notion of being anti-Semitic uh, from that perspective, I find polarizing. Some, some of you, because I, I can't see everyone because I'm just on my phone, I do see you. So if there are any African Americans in here, you know, you can you can tweet me or email me. You may be. Yes, there are. Yeah, I know that it is. I'm just saying I can't. But what I'm saying in general, you may be offended by that comment. But he's very anti-Semitic, and the Nation of Islam has had a history of anti-Semitism. The other history that I learned uh, when I joined Operation Understanding was, you know, the comments that Jesse Jackson made, uh, and those were very polarizing. Uh, what I do know from a strength-based perspective is what I learned from. Uh, Congressman Bill Gray, who was one of the co-founders of Operation Understanding. So a lot of the history uh, around anti-Semitism from Blacks to, to Jews, I don't know. Um, and then uh, I think there are more people who are more well-versed on the racism uh, from Jews to African-Americans. I, I can't speak to that because actually that's not anything that I've ever uh, focused on. Um, and maybe that's because of Jewish identity. I've been able to focus on uh, white racism and white supremacy from whites um, to, to African Americans, but I've never looked at it uh, from a Jewish concept, but I'm almost certain that there are people who are, you know, in here uh, who can speak more eloquently uh, to that than I can. Um, but I've also been in classrooms and I've been in corporate uh, boardrooms where, you know, uh, an African American has made a comment or a, a white person that I found out later uh, who was Jewish has said something along the lines of, you know, that guy is very articulate, you know, and I'm not saying that's racist, but it is a stereotype based on what? Articulate based on what? Historically, in reading Jonathan Kozol, Kozol's book, Maggie and Her Children, we learn of the uh, tenement apartments of uh, the welfare system, and a lot of our Jews historically at a particular point in time in New York were social workers, and Rabbi Glaser and I talked about this, uh, you know, individuals who were Jewish coming to take your children away from you. 
Uh, my history reads that they weren't taking your child away from you because you were African-American. They were taking your child away from you because you may have been presenting with some challenges and your children need to go into the system. Nevertheless, I don't want my comment to be taken out of context. Uh, that was my reading of Maggie and her children. Uh, but in ending, you pose a very great question. And if anyone has that history, uh, I'm willing to learn uh, because I believe like uh, Pablo Fieri in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that is not about me as the all knowing, but I also want to learn as well. And I think shared leadership and shared learning is the best way to go. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, how can we as a spiritual community be present to witness to the 400 year? Read that again, Rabbi. How can we as a spiritual community be present to witness to the 400 years? To be present and witness? To the 400 years. Okay. I think just as a spiritual community, um, one of the things that we never really talk about, whether we're Jews or African Americans, um, we talk about it, but we don't talk about it openly, is a, a, a moment of prayer. Uh, for our democracy. So when the other rabbi says, hey, after this, for those of you who need prayer, that, that's what we're going to engage in. And I think that even with me, uh, I told you before the call that I was going to be okay to be vulnerable because that's, it's life. Um, I'm a Christian. Um, and the challenges that have been happening, if I'm not on Canadian TV, if I'm not on NBC, if I'm not on Fox News, if I'm not on here with you all, I'm doing all these things, but since Saturday, where it went from civil protest to, you know, what we see, I, I haven't sat down and, and really truly prayed. I haven't asked for God to, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to heal the land. And, and I think the biggest challenge uh, is that we can't turn around the things that happen. So generational trauma, it exists. Um, but I, I liken it to Condoleezza Rice when they were talking to her about, you, you didn't grow up too far from the bombing that took place at the Birmingham jail uh, with the four little girls in Sunday school and you knew one of them, you know, uh, how come, you, you, what were you doing at that time? And she made a comment to the reporter. She was like, I was learning the piano. And they was like, oh God, that, she's just so out of touch. No, what she was really saying is that her parents at that particular point in time they shielded her from the viciousness of white supremacy. And so I think that that's the challenge um, for me is that even for you all, we know about the legacy or we should know. And if we don't, we can learn about the legacy and the viciousness of white supremacy in America for the 400 years that it's been here. And then we can pray fervently like those major and minor prophets uh, in the Torah and in the Bible, whether that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, Ezra, Nehemiah, all that. And and I think when we get to that level of using our spirituality and our religious traditions and cultures, it, it changes us because if we're, if we say, listen, three of the tenets of the civil rights movement is truth, love, and kindness, we operate in that. And so that's why I said, you know. I didn't make any apologies uh, when I said, hey, I know there are African-Americans here and I'm going to say what I say about Louis Farrakhan. Well, the reality is I would say it to Louis Farrakhan. I wouldn't say it like Jeremiah Wright. I would say like Martin Luther King would love, hey man, you're anti-Semitic. You know, one, white people are not devils. Jews are not this. Um, and we also have to be able to call out our community uh, because if, if I'm not here tonight with you all, but I'm somewhere else, the person that's breaking into my home I'm not stereotyping because whatever the circumstances are, it's not Jewish and white. It's just not, <laughs> you know? Um, so for me, I live in a body where I have to be fearful of the cops. A glare of stare could cost me a life by someone that looks like me. And then education and, and economic privilege trends in a way where it's like, Chad, you're a sellout. Well, I'm, I'm not a sellout. I don't want to live in North Philadelphia anymore. I mean, I want better. And so I just think that we pray. I think that we pray. That's why I opened up with this, the statement that I had uh, with regards to, you know, um, Isaiah, who will go? I, I will go send me. Um, but it's painful. You know, I have not, I've been able to intellectually compartmentalize it, you know, because I got a trend with these interviews. I got a trend with uh, 
the burden of all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm hurting because another black male uh, lost his life um, at the hands of the state. Um, and then the African-American community will get mad at me because I don't believe in rioting and looting. And that's why I say King's con con the context of King's quote, the, the riots are the language of the unheard, but, but not in this way. I don't believe it's in this way, whether that's agent provocateurs or not, whether it's interlopers or not. You, you couldn't come in my household with a pair of sneaks, which I did, and Sergeant Lasseter said, where did you get those from? And I lied. It was the last time I lied. I said, oh, Dad, you know, I'm on the basketball team. Coach gave them to me. He said, well, how come your cousin didn't come in with the same pair of sneaks? Where did you get those sneaks? Cousin Kenny, he gave them to me. Cousin Kenny was one of the biggest drug dealers in and around uh, Hunting Park on 8th, 8th Street. Ethan Butler. My dad said, take them sneaks down to him. I said, okay. I took them off and went to go put on another pair of sneaks. Sergeant Lasseter said, no, no. Walk down there barefooted. Barefooted? I said, mom? She said, you heard your dad. Now, I don't know if it was the PTSD that mother Lasseter didn't want to engage in him and, and wanted me to do what he said, but I think it was the moral compass of the household. So you loot, you burn down the city of Philadelphia, you come in a house with one TV, and, and I'm not stereotyping and generalizing. I know this for a fact. Uh, a parent says, why did you only get one? Or uncle says, I told you LeBron James is in size 14. Why do you have these? Well, um, we can still sell them. That's not cute. That's disgusting. That's appalling. And I said the other day on Fox News 29 with Senator Vince Hughes that in East Oak Lane, and I was very clear to give where I live, in East Oak Lane at the CVS on Broad and 66, my 79-year-old mother on Monday was going to go there and the Holy Spirit told me to tell her don't go, and they had robbed the CVS. And just like I'm looking at you, I said, I'm saying to the, the individuals out there who engage in misbehavior for whatever reason, I'm a nonviolent person, but I had I been at the CVS with my mother, I would have protected her by any means necessary. Now, I've already disclosed to you all, I don't know how to fight, so I'm glad nobody has come after me because I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> so, Chad, I, I particularly want to highlight your call for us to stand together in coalition. Yeah. And I, I think as we do that, we need to bring who we are. We need to, to really, however we engage, we need to get, engage as ourselves. Yeah. Right? Deepen your understanding of the issues. Read. If you read novels, read novels. If you read policy, read policy. If you listen to podcasts, listen to podcasts. If you love art, explore what black art is. If you love music, explore the roots of black music. Learn about histories and cultures and foods. You know, whoever it is that you are and what you love, engage with it, understanding that there's so much to learn from the Black community's experience and Black community's culture. Um, take the lens of racism and put it over what you see. So I, I'm going to give you my example. My, this, is, this, is, this was a powerful example in my life. And it, frankly, it was fairly recent for me. As a Jew, George Washington's quote to the community, the Jewish community in Rhode Island, Right? To bigotry, no sanction. The United States gives to bigotry, no sanction. As a Jew, that's a really powerful and meaningful quote for me. Mm. And then you look at that quote and you remember that that man owns slaves. Wow. What do I do with that? Yeah. Welcome to the contradictions of the world. Yeah. Right? Take that lens when you read an article in the newspaper and how would this be if I were black? What does this mean for the black community? You can do it for other communities too, right? What does that crack on the sidewalk mean if you're disabled and you can't get your wheelchair across it, right? Bring, bring who you are and look and, and your empathy and look through other people's lives and stand together. And I'm very grateful to you, Chad, for joining us tonight. I look, I am so grateful to you for being my partner in so many ways and for being an inspiration. Um, and I am grateful to everyone who participated in this series of conversations and this conversation this evening. And as we know, this is not the end of the conversation. This is the beginning. Um, and I look forward to working with you all going forward. Um, I hope this evening's conversation has, has bolstered hope um, 
and a sense of direction for all of us. And, and Abe and Annie, thank you for continuing from this moment into a spiritual space. Uh, thank you, Bhatia. Um, and uh, I want to thank you, Chad. I've been so uh, touched this evening, and my uh, eldest daughter has been with us as well. Um, oh. So touched this evening by your honesty, by um, the your by your sharing your truth. And um, I just, you know, my my prayer is that all of this uh, COVID nineteen should pass as quickly as possible so I can meet you in person and actually give you a hug, um, which is, uh, I, I but I'm, <laughs> but I'm, my heart is hugging right now, Chad. It's, um, it's been so meaningful to have you with us. And uh, to all of you from BZBI and from the broader Philadelphia community, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, where are we going to give just maybe three minutes before we start the service? So, uh, you know, people have a chance to log off if you want to log off, um, but we encourage you to stay and we're going to share, um, share some prayers of the heart, uh, sing a little bit and, uh, and welcome the night. to the one who rolls darkness away from light and light away from darkness and darkness into light and light into darkness. The Jewish day starts at night. The Jewish day starts at night with a radical act of hoping, of praying, of reaching out for a new dawn to come. And we follow the rhythms of time. We watch the moon, expand and contract to light our way through the dark night. We watch periods of history where we are moving closer to liberation and we see periods of backlash and then reconstruction and we are aware of these cycles of time always moving. And when night comes, we call out in, in prayer that we can bring a new dawn. We have so much work to do. And thank you, Chad, for, for being with us and inspiring us as we commit to this work to do in our Jewish community. Um, 
and we are praying to strengthen ourselves to do the work of anti-racism in our own Jewish communities where we have uh, Jews of color and white Jews and Jews of many different ethnicities and backgrounds. We're committing to this work within our communities. We're committing to this work in our neighborhoods, in our city, and we have so much work to do. And so we pray for the courage to do this work. And we know as we do this work that we are loved by an unending love. And we'll recite together Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Tiyahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol levavcha ubechol nafshecha ubechol meodecha Vehayu advarim ha'ele Asher anochi mitzavecha Yom ha'levavecha Veshinantam levanecha Vidibarta bam Veshivtecha vavitecha Uvlechtecha vaderech Ushofecha ukumecha Ukshartam leot al yadecha Vehayu letotafot beneinecha Uchtavtam almazuzot beitecha uvisharecha. When I was a kid, um, I had a babysitter who shared that her nightly ritual was. Uh, to ask God to take her troubles from her so that she could sleep, um, you know, to, to lift her worries and her cares so that she could sleep peacefully for the night. Um, and she told me that she always promised to take them back in the morning. And, I'm, and I was thinking about her today and thinking about that ritual and thinking about um, what does it mean to ask God to, to carry our burden if we promise to take it back? Um, and thinking about in a time of, of so much trouble and so much fear, um, on the one hand, to be able to give that up and to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to lie down tonight in bed and I'm going to pull that blanket up to my chin and leave it all behind and sleep peacefully. Um, and thinking about what it would mean, you know, in that bargain with God, if we only get to do that, if we're willing to pick up that burden again in the morning, right? If, if, if the peace of mind that we seek to sleep for tonight, if we only deserve that, if we are willing to pick the burden back up and to say, I'm not going to look away forever. I'm not going to pretend that I don't see the pain that I see in the world. But, you know, between 10 o'clock tonight and 5.30 tomorrow morning, I'm not going to do anything about it. There's nothing for me to do about it. Um, and, and more than that, to pray to God and to say, God, let me rest so that I'll have the strength to continue the struggle. Let me rest so that I'll have the wisdom to teach and to learn. Let me rest so that I'll have the courage to speak truth and the courage and the compassion to listen to truth. And so we ask God, Hashki Venu, lay us down, tuck us in, divine parent divine babysitter, right? lift our burden, hold our burden, hold us and tuck us in and let us rest this night safe from fear so that we can get back to work tomorrow. Ah. 
Take some time now for personal reflection. Um, some may want to recite the Amidah for Ma'ariv or just to sit for a few minutes in quiet meditation. Shalom, Yaseh 
shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yalko Yisrael ose shalom b'mromav, u'ya se shalom aleinu, v'yalko Yisrael, v'yalko our service with Mourner's Kaddish and tonight as well want to lift up the name, lift up the memory of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and others of our black brothers and sisters and siblings who have been killed um, by, by violence and cruelty. Um, in recent days and over the past uh, entire history of our country, just saying a few of the names at this moment of, of memory um, uh, in order to bring blessing to their memories. I uh, want to also uh, invite if anyone is marking a yard site tonight for um, saying Kaddish, if you'd like to share a name of someone you're remembering, um, you can, uh, Unmute yourself or, or put in the chat box. Mourner's Kaddish is on uh, page 151. If you have Sidor Sim Shalom, um, all those who are in mourning, or marking your site, or if it's your custom to do so, will rise for Kaddish. And uh, if Folks are unable to unmute yourselves. We can uh, answer each other with amen. Uh, be here uh, together in this moment. Amen. <laughs> As we conclude tonight, I was struck by um, Chad Lassiter this evening talking about being a prisoner of hope. Um, and I, I've never heard that expression before. I've been thinking about um, like what that might mean, what that experience might be like. And so I wanna, I wanna pray for all of us tonight um, that we should also be captured and held by hope. And um, in those moments where we feel like we're losing hope, um, that, that hope shouldn't lose us. Right? And, and, that, and even if we, um, you know, if, if we're not feeling hopeful, um, that perhaps we can find that hope is still feeling us. Um, and that 
and that in in that yearning in asking that question right um it's in the psalm the ayin yavo ezri where will my hope come from that in in the looking is the finding as well and that and that even even in those moments right because it is it is always just a moment in those moments where we lose hope the hope won't lose us Thank you all for sticking around to be with us. Thank you, Rabbi Annie, for a beautiful davening tonight. Um, I want to remind everybody again of uh, tomorrow night's interfaith prayer vigil uh, that's being hosted by the Interfaith Center of Philadelphia. Um, again, I just put the link back in the chat box. Um, so click the link now, uh, register, sign up for tomorrow so that uh, you'll be able to be there because um, because we all we all need one another's prayers, and I I can't think of um, of a better opportunity for that than to be able to pray together with all of the people of faith, all the people of good faith of Philadelphia. And then I want to wish everyone a good night's sleep. Thank you, Rabbi Abe and Rabbi Annie. Thank you, thank you Arlene. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.